the following is presented by CrewRoundTable.com Podcast Network. Why do we normally avoid online discussions about politics and religion? We avoid these topics at all costs, lest the troll army rises and we get sucked into a bottomless pit of retweets and name-calling until it's all just a wall of noise and we throw up our hands in exhausted defeat. Disagreements, however, are a fact of life. The aversion towards discussing politics and religion online has taken over real-life conversation as well. I don't agree with this position, and I ask you to think over this simple question. Would it surprise you to find out you are always right, and everyone who disagrees with you is always wrong? If you are a reasonable person, you know you don't have all the answers, and you recognize there is a discussion to be had. So, is there a good way to talk about politics and religion? Hot takes are the bridge between new ideas and good ideas. This is Hot Takes with Gino. Welcome back, my friends, once again to the latest and greatest episode of Hot Takes with Gino, proudly presented by the Crew Roundtable Podcast Network. Please visit us on the web at crewroundtable.com, where you can subscribe to this and our flagship show, Crew Roundtable, conveniently packaged for you in one feed. Today we will focus more on the online forums for political and religious discussion. Uh, Face-to-face discussions are a much different beast, and most people, I believe, would never say the things they say on social media to someone in the flesh. That being said, what we discuss here today is good advice and could easily be applied to real-world conversations. Just in general, even if you were to agree that a particular issue needs to be discussed, and that being a particularly serious issue, whether it be politics, religion, or something else that you take to be important in your life, it's difficult to have a productive discussion online with someone who disagrees with your position and may possibly be at the polar opposite end of the spectrum. It's frustrating, and people avoid having these discussions. They see them as being too stressful. Many just give up trying to have meaningful online discussions at all, especially about politics and religion, do primarily, I believe, to trolls that try to hijack earnest discussions. For example, Canada's defense minister is dealing with an issue of stolen valor. So there's your date for when this podcast is being recorded. Um, The online comment sections on reporting that happens on this issue veer off into discussing hardwood lumber, carbon taxes, immigration, the Prime Minister's vacation destinations, Muslims, you name it, and the comments section will eventually find a way to introduce unrelated opinions to the issue being discussed. Uh, And I would encourage everyone at this point, please check out crewroundtable.com, where we had an entire episode devoted to comment sections, uh, online comment sections, And while you're there, please, of course, feel free to subscribe. There are two recent projects, getting back on topic to our our central idea of discussing politics and religion. Uh, There are two recent projects, one out of Duke University in North Carolina, and the other one out of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Boston, that hope to change the nature of online discussions. At the center of both studies is recognizing a trait called intellectual humility, which is a subset of general humility, a trait that facilitates one's search for knowledge. This refers both to one's awareness of the limits of their understanding and an openness to the idea of others. We're going to be discussing three uh, articles primarily here uh, in our show today. We're going to be primarily dealing with a a article from The Walrus, uh, which is entitled How Science Can Help Us Disagree, 
and then two articles from WashingtonPost.com. One is entitled, The Most Compelling Reason to Never Talk Politics on Facebook, and the other is entitled, How to Win a Facebook Argument According to Science. The Washington Post is double-dipping a little bit, but that's okay. We, we will allow that today. Back to the studies uh, from Duke and MIT. Uh, the results from those studies have been carried out on hundreds of people, and the data shows liberals and conservatives, so again, we're using the polls here from the United States where liberals are on the left and conservatives are on the right, uh, liberals and conservatives did not vary significantly in their level of intellectual humility. That is to say, both, both extremes, and everyone along the spectrum who identifies as one of those two, both may be equally open-minded or not. So there are hard heads and entrenched positions existing at all points on the political spectrum, not just on the extremes. This stands to reason, as everyone, as a human being with their own thoughts and experiences, will eventually reach a line that they cannot cross. Some of us just have very different lines. Everyone has some base ideas about the world and their place in it. And whether those notions are right or wrong is secondary to acknowledging that they exist. And you, you know, yes, you, might have some bedrock notions about the world that are incorrect. I relate back to our question that kicked off the discussion in the intro. And by you, of course, that's the royal you, where I include myself. And the royal you might not be a thing, but now I'm claiming it for the show. You heard it first on Hot Takes with Gino. Back to the studies. And the author of one of the studies says, What's surprising is that a coherent picture emerges about what intellectually humble compared to intellectually arrogant people are like. His example, for instance, intellectually humble people consider evidence more fully. And those stereotypes about how liberals, again the U.S. bias, about how liberals may be open-minded compared to conservatives, we just didn't find that. And that's from the author of the studies. Further results from these studies seems to confirm, and this is the, at least in my personal opinion, this is the exciting and new part. Uh, this is a part from just showing that people are generally willing to listen to another point of view at first blush. The important thing is that intellectual humility can apparently be learned. It's not some inborn need or some inborn trait uh, that you either have or don't have. It's a skill, and it's a personality trait that you can take on over time. Looking at online discussions, we have a lot of personal uh, personal attacks that take place online and in person during debates. And these are fueled by intellectual arrogance. People get stuck in their echo chambers where they feel that only their views are correct and they get disconnected from reason and evidence. How many people have you, and I put this out to the listenership, how many people have you blocked on Twitter or Facebook or stopped following because you simply disagree with them? We see this in the media where individuals will consume only media that they like in scare quotes and then believe the hot news story is the only story they see and the only version they know is the one presented by their chosen media outlet. The chosen media outlet likes having your eyeballs glued to their content so they feed you more of what you want to see. The echo chamber is achieved. We saw this in the recent American presidential election where Republicans and Democrats were both shocked out of their pants when Donald Trump won. Neither of these entities were willing to admit on their social media, and by these entities I mean the official parties uh, of the Democrats and the Republicans and their dyed-in-the-wool supporters, none of these entities were willing to admit on social media that the other side even had a shred of a good idea. And any mention of the other side was to browbeat and tear down the opposition in a nasty way that goes way beyond critiquing a policy position. And both sides were guilty of this. 
is it the fault of social media itself? Is there blame to be placed on social media? Twitter, Facebook, uh, I'm, Google, they keep trying to come up with one, <laughs> but um, those are the two th those are the two big ones. Uh, is there something inherent to keyboard warriors thinking they are untouchable that lets them say things online that, as I mentioned before, they would never say to someone in mixed company, in the flesh. There is a reason there is no dislike button on Facebook, because every idea would be downvoted to oblivion, no matter how much of a motherhood topic you think it may be. There will be a sizable vocal minority that will disagree with impunity to whatever idea you think is the most reasonable idea in the world. I guarantee it. Now, please keep in mind, I'm not saying that you should seek out abuse on Twitter and Facebook to refine your point of view, or that you should try and become some sort of martyr by waging into the mire that is the comment section. Uh, again, I, I encourage everyone to go and listen to the show that the Roundtable did on that. That's not the point of this show. The point on th The point of this show is that we need to break down and break out of that echo chamber. We need to interact at some point and at some level with people who don't think like you. Here's an exercise, and I encourage everyone to try it online, and please tell me how it goes. You can leave a comment on the website, or you can reach us on Twitter, at Crew Roundtable. I would like everyone to go out and engage in a political or religious discussion online without attempting to change someone else's view. Just state your own point of view. And I predict you'll quickly become the target of trolls and you should turn off the notification sound on your phone before it drives you batty. How can you engage on social, how can you engage on social media without full body armor and have a productive exchange of ideas. Even if you don't offer a competing uh, argument, if you're simply stating your own beliefs without trying to tear down someone else's, trouble will come and find you. So how do we get to that productive exchange of ideas? This is where a study from researchers at Cornell suggests that there are some specific techniques you can use to engage in arguments online. Now, by arguments, we don't mean, uh, you know, something that degenerates into fisticuffs. We're talking about point, counterpoint, debating back and forth, an argument. These are the points that, or the steps that they list that could help you have a more productive exchange of ideas online. Respond to the initial statement sooner rather than later that you happen to disagree or agree with. If you are the 203rd comment on some online article, don't even bother putting your putting your stuff online. No one's going to read your comment. The study also suggests that you respond in groups. You're more persuasive to the person you're arguing with if other people are arguing your side as well. This to me sounds a bit bullish, uh, saying that there is strength in numbers, not sure if I approve of this tactic. You should not have to rely on other people to carry your flag. You should be able to discuss your own ideas and your own political and religious views online without having to worry about the cavalry coming in to save you. That, that sort of defeats the purpose of trying to have a productive argument. Uh, next point, have a few back and forth exchanges with your opponent, but never go past three or four. Up to that point, your chance of persuading them is pretty good. Uh, for this one here, uh, it I sort of agree with this point, as it is a comment section after all. Uh, don't sit and write a book on your phone or your tablet. Um, other people won't read it anyway. And a few points to ponder on both sides of an argument is much better for someone who's reading this for the first time then the eventual screw yous shouted back and forth to each other when the conversation eventually stalls or turns personal. 
People aren't looking to read a book, as I said, in the comment section. You don't need to produce a thesis. You don't need to go online and start quoting outside evidence. Uh, simply state your piece and move on. The next point is don't quote the person that you're arguing with. I fully agree with this. That sounds like nitpicking or lawyering, and that's no way to have a discussion on social media. Uh, pull it, ripping apart someone's grammar or spelling in the age of a spell check uh, and autocorrect, mistakes can happen. You don't have to be a grammar Nazi. Um, just kind of, you know, get the gist of what people are saying online. It's not that. It's it's not that hard. Uh, next point: Don't act too intense. That scares people off. Uh, good advice, stick to being calm, use even-keeled language. Uh, that's just good advice in general for life. Next point, write a longer response if you're actually trying to change someone's opinion. One-liners won't do it, people. Uh, One-liners, you come across as a smartass, and a smartass never won an argument. Even when they win, they lose in the long run, and no one respects that position. It's not about gotcha answers when you're discussing something online. You can write something a little more substantial if you'd like, but again, keep in mind, you don't want to write a book. And the last point is to try and base your arguments around points that your opponent did not initially address. Again, bring in more facts and information. I wholeheartedly approve of this. Uh, and this is the last point on the list. I, I find it to be rather funny that introducing new and better information is the last point on a list of how to have a productive discussion with someone, but I'll leave that as it is. Uh, let's move on. Uh, so anyways, does that data show that using these techniques for online discussion prove effective at troll smiting? What does the study actually tell us? 70% of the people that this study looked at were unpersuadable, even when these techniques were used against their initial positions. Also, the links between these techniques and opinion changes are correlative, not causal. Uh, at this point, I do want to say please go to crewroundtable.com and look for my Hot Takes with Gino episode where I discuss correlation and causation so that you're aware of the giant difference between these two relationships. Final plug for the show, I promise. Well, until we get to the end in the outro, but you're a regular listener, you know how this works. Uh, so, even though we have these techniques for productive online discussion, they don't seem to work. And is that a fault of the technique? I don't, I don't think so. Uh, I, I think it comes more down to the people and how they interact online due to larger personalities taking over the conversation, much as they do in real life. And those larger personalities are willing to run towards the nuclear option while others just disengage from the abuse. Look back at President Trump. I still can't believe that's a thing. Look back at the American president, Donald Trump. No one will ever accuse him of having intellectual humility. Intellectual humility is a necessary condition for productive teamwork and leadership in general. It paves the way for an open-minded perspective on new solutions and new approaches to complex problems. Intellectual humility allows you the opportunity to find and adopt better solutions which come from other people. It allows for collaboration, deeper meaning, and arguments based on reason and facts instead of pure opinion. What's the call to action here? The call to action is to get out of your echo chambers, everyone. Get out of your echo chambers. Talk to someone who doesn't hold your world view. Talk to someone who is completely opposed to your world view. Engage another human being in a meaningful dialogue. Don't be afraid to talk politics and religion. Politics and religion are incredibly important in today's world. You should not be afraid to discuss these openly and honestly with someone, not with the intent of changing their mind, but with the intent 
of having them understand your position and you understanding where they are coming from. Having a free and open exchange of ideas, especially on these two topics, would be a great thing for society in general. And I ask you to sit back and think about this question. If you are afraid to merely state your opinion or your position, if you're unable to mount at least a passing defense of what you think you hold to believe is true, and if you're not capable of critically examining your own position and feel embarrassed about defending it, is that a sign that you might be holding the wrong position? As I said before, you don't have to go out and be a martyr for the faith and see every discussion of political position as a hill to die on. That is not what I'm saying. What I am saying is, you do need to evaluate your own position and have that intellectual humility to know you might not have all the answers. There is a responsibility to at the very least be informed and somewhat engaged with opposing views from time to time to affirm your beliefs pass intellectual muster. Keep in mind, this is coming to you from a guy with a solo podcast that has to keep the microphone from picking up echoes, and you decide the value of this advice. And on that happy note, please visit us at crewroundtable.com to subscribe to our flagship show, Crew Roundtable, a panel discussion where we debate topics from all points on the political spectrum, and you also get hot takes with Gino absolutely free of charge. Until next time, take care of yourselves, everyone.